Good evening and welcome to our Good Friday service. Thank you for joining us. Hear our call to worship. The people stood yelling, crucify, and it breaks our heart every time. For Jesus' death occurs every time someone is ignored, mistreated, or oppressed. Crucify, it tears away at God's beloved creation. Our service begins this evening with this single word, crucify. Hear now our prayer of reconciliation, our confession and pardon. Ever-present God, on this Good Friday night, our whole world is engulfed in shadows as we remember the story of Jesus' death. We confess that we want to push the fast-forward button on this familiar story because it hurts so much. It hurts to think of the betrayal and arrest of Jesus to imagine him abandoned and suffering. It hurts to watch your light overtaken by the shadows of the world. But we must each find our place in this crucifixion story and feel the pain that is there. The pain of this world, of faithless decisions, of betrayal, of injustice. Jesus entered that pain out of faithfulness to you and to me, to witness to the truth that is justice, wholeness, and love. We confess that we are afraid to enter this pain with Jesus. So we ask you to strengthen us with your courage. Let us know that you are present with us now as always. Hear the assurance of pardon. Beloved followers of Jesus, it is okay to feel hurt and uncomfortable as you enter into the story and imagine your place in it. Know that God meets you in this story with comfort as well as challenge, with courage as well as love. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven.
Good evening, my brothers and sisters. I am to present to you the seven last words of Jesus Christ. The Romans used one of the most painful methods of torture ever devised to put Jesus to death. Crucifixion was used by many nations of the ancient world, including Assyria, Media, and Persia. The idea may have originated from the practice of hanging up the bodies of a executed persons on stakes for public display. This discouraged civil disobedience and marked defeated military foes. Crucifixion on a stake or cross was practiced by the Greeks, notably Alexander the Great, who hung over 2,000 people on the cross when the city of Tyre was destroyed. During the period between Greek and Roman control of Palestine, the Jewish ruler Alexander Janaeus crucified 800 Pharisees who opposed him. But such executions were condemned as detestable and abnormal even in that day, as well as by the letter uh, Jewish history, historians Josephus. From the early days of the Roman Republic, death on the cross was used for rebellious slaves and bandits. This practice continued well beyond the New Testament period as one of the supreme punishments for military and political crimes such as desertion, spying, revealing secrets, rebellion, and sedition. However, following the conservation of Constantine, the cross became a sacred symbol and its use was a means of execution, of execution was abolished. Crucifixion involved attacking the victim with nails through the wrist or with leather uh, thongs to a cross beam attached to a vertical state. Sometimes blocks or pins were put on the stake to give the victim support as he hung, uh, uh, hung suspended from the cross beam. At times, the feet were also nailed to the vertical state. At, as the victim hung dangling by the arms, blood could no longer circulate to his vital organs. Only by supporting himself on the seat or pin could he gain some relief. Gradually, exhaustion set in and death followed. If the victim had been beaten, he would not have lived long. To hasten death, the executioner sometimes broke the victim's legs with a club. Then he could no longer support his body to keep blood circulation and death by suffocation would quickly follow. Usually bodies were left to rot on or on uh, to be eaten, left on the, uh, on the, on the uh, cross or to be eaten by scavengers. To the Jewish people, crucifixion represented the most disgusting form of death. He who is hanged is accused of God. Yet the Jewish council sought to obtain Roman authorization to have Jesus crucified. The Apostle Paul summed up the crucial importance of his manner of death when he wrote, we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness, but the, to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God is the wisdom of God. Out of the ugliness and agony of crucifixion, God accomplished the greatest good of all, the redemption of sinners. The seven last words of Jesus on the cross are referred to as seven 
last sayings of Jesus Christ. These words also meant that he, his suffering was over and the whole work his father had given him to do was over. He brought salvation into the world. Now I will go through the seven last words or sayings of Jesus Christ. The first being, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The reference here of scripture is Luke 23, 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. This first saying of Jesus on the cross is traditionally called the word of forgiveness. It is theologically interpreted as Jesus' prayer for forgiveness for those who were crucifying him, the Roman soldiers, and apparently for all others who were involved in his crucifixion. Some early manuscripts do not include this sentence as in Luke 23, 34. The second word of Jesus Christ. Today, you will be with me in paradise. The scripture reference is Luke 23, 43. Luke 23, 43. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This saying is traditionally called the word of salvation. The word of salvation. Well, according to Luke's gospel, Jesus was crucified between two thieves, tr traditionally named Dismas and Gaetus, one of whom supports Jesus' innocence and asks him to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. Jesus replied, I say to you, followed with the only appearance of the word paradise in the Gospels of Jesus Christ, this day you will be with me in paradise. A seemingly simple change in punctuation in this saying has been the subject of doctrinal differences among Christian groups given the lack of punctuation in the original Greek's text. Catholics and most Protestant uh, Christians usually use a version which reads, today you will be with me in paradise. This reading assumes a direct voyage to heaven and has no implications of purgatory. On the other hand, some Protestants who believe in soul sleep have used a reading which emphasizes, I say to you today, leaving open the possibility that the statement was made today, but arrival in heaven may be later. The third word, behold your son, behold your mother. The reference of this scripture is found in John 19, 26 through 27 and it reads Jesus saw his own mother and the disciples standing near whom he loved he said to his mother woman behold your son then he said to the disciple behold your mother and from that hour he took his mother into his family this statement is traditionally called the word of relationship. And in it, Jesus entrusts uh, Mary, his mother, into the care of the disciple whom Jesus loved. Jesus was, John was referred as Jesus' beloved disciple. <laughs>
now the fourth word. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The reference scripture here is Matthew 27, 46. Matthew 27, 46. Around the ninth hour, Jesus shouted in a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Another reference scripture is Mark 15, 34. That's Mark 15, 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus shouted in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is the only saying that appears in more than one gospel and is a quote from Psalms 22 too. Uh, this saying is taken by some as an abandonment of the son by the father. Other theologians understand the cry as that of one who was truly human and who felt forsaken, put to death by his foes, very largely deserted by his friends, and he may have felt also deserted by God the Father. Other, the others point to this as the first word in Psalms 22 and suggest that Jesus recited these words, perhaps even the whole psalm, that he might show himself to be the very being by whom the word refers, so that the Jewish scribes and people might examine and see the cause why he should not uh, descend from the cross, namely because this very psalm showed that it was appointed that he should suffer these things. Theologian Frank Stagg points to what he calls a mystery of Jesus' incarnation. He who died at Golgotha, and we know it as Calvary, is one with the Father, that God was in Christ, and that at the same time, he cried out to the Father. The fifth saying, I thirst. Scripture references is John 19, 28. He said, I thirst. This statement is traditionally called the word of distress and is compared and contrasted with the uh, word uh, that is found in the scripture. And it, and it also encounters, it shows the encounter of Jesus with the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4, 4 through 26. As in the other accounts, the Gospel of John says Jesus was offered a drink of sour wine, adding that this person placed a sponge dipped in wine on a hyssop branch and held it to Jesus' lips. Hyssop branches had figured significantly in the Old Testament and in the book of Hebrews. The statement of Jesus interp is interpreted by John as fulfillment of the prophecy given in Psalms. In Psalms 69, 21, I repeat, in Psalms 69, 21, and of course, Psalms 22, 15. Hence the quotation from John's gospel includes the comment to fulfill the scriptures. The sixth word and the scripture reference to it is finished is found in John 19.30 where Jesus said it is finished. This statement is traditionally called the word of triumph and is theologically interpreted as the announcement of the end of the earthly life of Jesus in anticipation for the resurrection. Adam Hamilton writes, 
these last words are seen as a cry of victory, not of dereliction. Jesus had now completed what he came to the earth to do. A plan was fulfilled. A salvation was made possible. A love shown. He had taken our place. He had demonstrated both humanity's brokenness and God's love. He had offered himself fully to God as a sacrifice on behalf of humanity. And as he died, and as he said, it is finished. With these words, the noblest person, whoever walked the face of this planet, God in the flesh breathed his last breath. The seventh word, seventh and final word of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The reference text is found in Luke 23, 46. Luke 23, 46. And in speaking in a loud voice, Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. From Psalms 31, 5, this saying, uh, this, which is an announcement and not a request, is traditionally called the word of reunion. The word of your reunion with his Father in heaven. And it's theologically interpreted as the proclamation of Jesus joining God the Father in heaven. Adam Hamilton has written that when darkness seemed to, to prevail in life, it takes faith even to talk to God, even if it is to complain to him. These last words of Jesus from the cross show his absolute trust in God. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. This has been termed a model of prayer for everyone when you're afraid, you're sick, or facing one's own death. It is in effect. I commit myself to you, O oh God, in my living and in my dying, in the good times and in the bad, whatever I am and have, I place in your hands, O oh God, for your safekeeping. Yes, Jesus is crying in a loud voice. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last breath. Jesus' death on the cross of Calvary was the culmination of his incredible work of love for us people. By his death, he reconciled those who believed in him with God. And through his life, he opened a way back to the Father for those who follow him. Though death over sin, through death over sin, Jesus conquered death. By his life, he gave us his, he gave up his life. May his sacrifice not be in vain. May he have many disciples who he is ashamed to call his brothers and sisters, meditating on the seventh word. Now it is the end, the very end, the end of the ordeal, the end of suffering, and Jesus alone on the cross, tortured, exhausted, abandoned by his friends, forsaken by God, grasps for a last breath, and gathers the strength for one final cry. Jesus entrusted his spirit, his life, and all that has given it meaning to God uh, in faith, even at the point of his own abandonment, when the good seems so very far away. He proclaims his faith in God the darkness cannot overcome. By this act of crucifixion on the cross, God accomplished the greatest good for all, the redemption of sinners. So my friends, my church uh, family, know that we can revive our lives, our Christian commitment, renew our place 
on this Christian journey and restore our original, our original Christian commitment. Amen. As we come to the conclusion of this celebration of these last words of Jesus Christ on the cross, I want to say that I truly hope that you have gotten something good, something to guide your life, your religious life, uh, in Christ Jesus. Now prepare for benediction. Now to him who is able to keep us uh, and to keep you from falling and to present you without blemish before the presence of, of uh, his glory with rejoicing. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. God bless you all.